Good morning, everyone. Well, we're back at the cabin again, and yes, it's the end of summer. Time for change. Fall is definitely in the air. It's been raining uh, for a little while here on arrival, so got to find something to do, and certainly there's lots to do and see around the cabin this time of year. Come check it out. So it's a little bit more green than it was in the woods last year. If you go back to my end of summer update last year, it looked really, really dried out. But uh, cloudy day today, but lots of green still on the trees. Do have some leaves down, but not a whole lot. Forest floor is covered in these beautiful asters. They're a broad leafed plant and this time of year their beautiful purple flowers are in bloom. So it's really nice to see them out in front of the cabin, makes it look really nice. Kind of like I planted this little garden or something like that. But indeed it is nature's garden. Speaking of gardens, well, here's a little story for you. Got in here late last night and of course it's the long weekend in Canada. Um, here in Ontario the first weekend is called Labor Day weekend in September. So everybody's back out to their cabins having lots of fun. And uh, we left groceries till the last task of the day and sort of forgot that stores, you know, close a little early uh, on the weekend due to the holiday and only had sort of a skeletal amount of groceries. Let me tell you, last night I was a little disappointed. You know, this weekend I was going to have bacon, I was going to have all kinds of stuff that I really, really wanted here at the cabin. Um, and I wasn't in a great mood because, uh, you know, you had to sort of stop at the convenience store and grab a few things that are highly processed and things like that. And then I sort of sat and thought for a while. You know, I'm thinking, Jen, where are you? Of course, you're here at the property, at the cabin. This land will provide for you. There's no need to panic that, you know, you're going to suffer all weekend with, you know, highly processed food and things like that. It's just, I don't know where my head was. I just wasn't thinking properly. And uh, so what did I do? I put my mind to the task and I went out and did some late night foraging. Yes, that's right. I went out and to make supper, I went out and got some mushrooms by headlamp basically. So I walked through the woods. Um, that was a really awesome experience actually going out in the dark, going after my food. Um, so I ended up finding uh, a bunch of mushrooms to eat, which was awesome. And then of course I remembered, hey, you have a little garden, you know. So went over and checked out what I had. And of course here's my little garden and uh, had some wonderful peas. So I had a whole bunch of these. I've left a couple left on the vine for later. And I also planted some onions and I had some leftover potatoes from last year. So let's go check those out. Here are my onions. There's shallots that I planted there because they're kind of small regardless. Also in here were some potatoes. And I found the world's largest toad actually right in there as I was digging up one of the potatoes. Um, a little toad popped out and surprised me. I don't know whether it was ready to hibernate or it sensed that there was some weather coming in and got under the soil. Anyway, it was really cool to see. So it just goes to show you, you know, I collected some mushrooms and some onions and potatoes and made a wonderful stir fry. Um, oh, and the peas. Um, made a wonderful stir fry for supper and had some fresh prepared things. The land does provide. So when you live or you have a cabin off grid, don't forget that your land is there to help you out and uh, just learn it really well. And then you'll know that in a pinch, it can help you out and get you a great supper. Especially this time of year, you know, we're hearing about all these terrible things happening across the world, the floods, the monsoons, um, being prepared and knowing um, what to do in those situations. And, you know, if you are off grid or you have a cabin off grid, knowing your land um, so that it can provide for you in times of, you know, say an emergency situation or, you know, you're like me and, you know, you're not really prepared in the, you know, traditional sense of, you know, going to the store and grabbing your food things like that, knowing that uh, what you can do to feed yourself and take care of yourself in a pinch. You know, it does require a change of thought, you know, so, and your thought process, because we're so ingrained in this idea of getting things from stores and, uh, you know, everything being kind of handed to us that way. We have to go back to our old ways of thinking where we find things on the land and are resourceful and uh, put our thinking cap on. So anyway, I solved my problem last night and we'll continue to do so while we're here. Uh, we'll be foraging for more things to uh, augment the, the little I don't know, skeletal amount of food that we brought with us. All right, so I'm going to go grab some onions and I have some leftover mushrooms from last night. Going to make another uh, fry up for breakfast this morning. So there we go. There's some shallots there right now. Just going to take a couple of them. Don't need a whole lot. Save some for later and we'll do a fry up. After breakfast, looks like I'm going to have to put on a raincoat and I'll take you around and show you how things are doing around the cabin. 
Here you can see some of the mushrooms I'm going to prepare for breakfast and oh, there's my little onion. So get ready with that. We'll wash them up and get ready to pan fry them in a little bit of oil. All right, everything's sort of cleaned up there. So I'm just going to chop it up and get it ready to pop in the pan. A little bit of oil in the pans. I'm also going to make some bannock on uh, the deeper frying pan here. Pretty excited about that. Get our mushrooms and onions going. I'm just going to add a little pinch of salt. Maybe a couple. Here's the overhead view of the yumminess. We'll let that cook. I just want to show you my setup for the propane tank. So normally these guys take the very small propane tank, kind of connected right here through this little arm. But as you can see on Amazon, I got this little connector that goes from here all the way down to your typical larger barbecue tanks. So that's really awesome. It saves a lot on the uh, throwing out of those little green propane canisters. So I'll put a link below to this item right here. I really like it um, for connecting your little cooktops to the larger propane tanks. Doesn't that look scrumptious? Our bannock's just about done as well. Well, that's how I'm finally plating out my meal. I think it looks amazing. Well, I'm going to go eat my breakfast and then I'll uh, pop on my raincoat and take you guys for a tour and see what's going on around the cabin. thought I'd start off by talking about heating for this winter. So in the past, you know, I have this uh, kerosene heater here. It gives off about 10,000 BTU. It's the uh, Carol World KC 1104 model. Up to this point, we've liked it, but we're thinking of putting in a wood stove kind of in this little spot right here in the corner. And I know you're thinking, wow, that's a really tight space. Where are you going to put a wood stove in there? We're thinking of putting in a cubic mini stove, mainly the Grizzly model. I don't know if you've heard about these wood stoves, but they're uh, really awesome for small cabins, RVs, uh, any small space that you want to have heated with wood. So in the space behind me, it's there's not a lot of uh, area there, but with the wall mount shield and the shielding for the flue, we'll be able to put the little wood stove up on the wall right against it. I'll show you here um, the Grizzly model. So as you can see, it's pretty small. It even has a little cooking area at the top there. It's made in Canada, in Quebec. And uh, they re retail for about 599 Canadian. Of course, you have to buy the other parts for it, you know, the flue and the, the wall shield and things like that. And um, it's made from laser cut steel, uh, 1 8 to 3 16 thick, and produces about 8,000 to 1,800 BTUs. And uh, very easy to install. Its dimensions are 12 by 11 by 15 inches, so it's pretty, pretty small compared to a lot of other wood stoves out there and it's um, very eco-friendly. It's able to combust the firewood um, so that it produces very minimal smoke. So it has a double walled flue and uh, the flue itself is three inches in diameter. So three inch diameter flue is always a bit of a concern. Um, you want to make sure it stays uniformly heated throughout. You want to get a lot of creosote buildup. Um, so I like the idea that it is double walled flue. Um, we'll probably, you know, we'll try, try to take it out of the top of the cabin, although we aren't sure. So the other option is to take it out uh, the wall behind me, but then you're going to have two 90 degree bends, which also creates problems. So um, probably take it out the roof if we're going to do the install on this one. Um, but we'll, we'll see. We're still doing the research there and uh, hopefully we'll get this set up before this winter. And I should mention uh, the Grizzly uh, wood stove takes wood that's about six by three quarter inch long um, because the firebox itself is seven by nine and a half by seven inches. So Take smaller pieces of wood, so it requires a lot more preparation. But from what I've seen online and heard about, the uh, the stove works really, really well and heats up spaces between 200 square feet and 400 square feet really effectively. Some people even said it got really too warm for them. So um, it encourages me it's probably the right product uh, for this place. But I'd be interested to see if you guys have experienced with these cubic mini stoves. The models they have are the Cub and the Grizzly. The Cub is a smaller unit and the Grizzly is a larger unit. So um, Make a note in the comments down below if you have experience with these stoves and any advice for me. I picked this up the other day for about 20 bucks. This is uh, just to help me chop some of the little sticks on the uh, trees around here. Didn't buy it with a pole, but uh, got some ironwood, so basically just made a pole out of that. Just going to uh, chop a few little dead sticks off of the trees around here. And it works really well. The high bush cranberries did really well this year. 
Look at all that growth. Looks like they were nibbled on a little bit, maybe by deer or something like that, or possibly rabbits. But uh, all my plants did very well. Thank goodness we had a lot of rain this year. This young jack pine did especially well. Uh, when I planted it, it was oh, pretty small. And now look at all these little tiny needles coming up. It's very robust. It's probably about a foot tall now or more. Maybe that's about 16 inches or so. So that's wonderful. It's nice that the grass is kind of dying back now in the field. So there's less competition for them. You can see along this row right here are the red oak that I put in. So they definitely have a good leaf cluster and are very hardy looking plants. This one's really sturdy, although it's starting to lean. So I'll probably want to stake it up a little bit uh, just to help it along for the winter. Of course, we have some red oak in the woods here and I've uh, harvested a few of the acorns. I think I'm going to try to plant a few more and see if I can seed some naturally. So I just want to show you what they look like. Here are the acorns right here. Got a few of them. I'm going to plant them and see if I can't uh, grow my own seedlings from stock from the property. This year I also had the opportunity to plant a walnut. Um, one of the walnuts from my tree at home, you remember last year, um, dropped a lot of nuts. I harvested many of them, but I guess I skipped a few, which is good. And uh, one actually went to seed and became a little tiny walnut tree. So I brought it here to the cabin and I planted it. I want to show you what it looks like. Here's where I have it all set up. And this is the uh, black walnut. So that was last year's uh, seed, basically. Last year's uh, walnut that uh, created this little guy. As you can see, the cabin's right there and uh, I put it right in this clearing. Walnut love a lot of sunshine. So as you can see up here, it's a nice big gap in the canopy. So I think it should do just fine. This year, the choke cherries got decimated by the bugs and the tent caterpillars and the birds and the coyotes ate all the berries off of them this year. So that's fine this year. I'm going to uh, get some hawberries. I'm here at the hawberry tree and it's going to be a bumper year. Look at all those beautiful red berries from the hawthorn tree here. You can see them. So I didn't target them last year because it was uh, time for them to regenerate and for uh, the berries to drop off and seed other hawthorn bushes. So this year I'm going to be targeting them, but I'm going to wait another month or so until they're fully ripe and bright red. There is a beautiful monarch. They're getting ready to migrate down to Mexico. How cool is it that they are dining on some goldenrod in our field? Well, today it's a little rainy, so I decided I'd head out and do a little bit of mushrooming. So let's go see what we can find today. Um, need something to do on a rainy day, right? One important thing to do when you're uh, doing some foraging for mushrooms is to take note of the tree stands or the trees that you're near. That'll be really helpful in your identification of the mushroom you found. Quite often a lot of field guides mention um, the types of trees that the mushrooms are found under. So take note of what's above your head. Here's a little yellow mushroom that I want. This is a beautiful chanterelle. Wow, beautiful smell of apricots. So happy I'm seeing some of these this fall. Here's another mushroom. You can see it's got a little brown cap and it's in the bolete family. It's got the little pores underneath. It's got some bug damage, so you can see those little brown dots. It has these little uh, rough hairs on the stem. I mean, now most of them are eaten off as you can see in this specimen right here but here's a sample of what the outer part of the stem used to look like. So this is in an area where there is so birch and aspen. This is likely the birch bolete. Yes I found more of those bolete so I'm going to harvest them. They're a perfect specimens. Woohoo! And here is a type of puffball mushroom. This would be a little bit smaller compared to the giant puffball, but you can see there's these little tiny scales. I don't know if you can appreciate that. There's little tiny scales on the surface of it. And it was growing here on this uh, moss-covered log. And when you cut it through and through, it actually is quite solid. So these guys are edible as well. 
probably pass on this one because it looks pretty infested there. Something is drilled through both sides of it, probably a slug. So we'll just leave it be in the forest. And here we have some hedgehog mushrooms, which are also edible. These ones are pretty old, so I think I'll just leave them to return to the soil. So while I'm hunting for chanterelles, I found this other mushroom, and I just wanted to show it to you guys. So there it is in situ. It's got gills and it's kind of orange, so its top kind of caves in a bit. When we remove it here, you can see how beautiful it is. And well, look at that, look at the stem. You see how it's oozing a liquid? It looks sort of like latex. And it's a very, very bright orange. This mushroom is Lactarius finos. And you know, it's very distinctive because of its color. And as you can see, it's oozing this really cool orange latex. Mushrooms in the Lactarius family do ooze uh, a latex-like substance, and um, there are even blue ones too that release an indigo blue um, milky discharge. And so also too, if I'm going to break the cap, you're going to see right there as well, there's that shocking orange color of the uh, fluid seeping out of it. I just want to show this to you. This is not a chanterelle. See, it has the true gills, and um, you know when you break it open, it has this orange liquid coming out. As you can see, the stem is actually hollow, and uh, obviously it's white inside. The outside where I popped it open actually has that that orange milky latex inside. It's kind of mealy and hollow. It's back at the cabin now, and I just want to show you a saffron milk cap that I found on the way back to the cabin. Has a varying degree of green on the cap, and uh, you can see right here it looks a little bit oxidized, that coppery kind of green color. It's got that uh, orange latex that's oozing out of it. Well, that's not bad for a morning out foraging. I showed you earlier there was a bunch of those hedgehog mushrooms, but they were kind of seen the best of their days, so I just left them be. Had some hedgehogs for dinner last night, so got my hedgehog mushroom fixed, but now I've got my chanterelles and my bolites. So pretty happy about that. Just want to show you a little close up here of these bolides that I showed you in the woods. And I've cut one of them in half. And uh, as you can see, you know, the flesh here just sort of stains like a very lightish brown when you cut it through. But interestingly enough, right at the base, it turns sort of a bluey green, kind of like the top here on the little grill I have. Very cool. I'm gonna do a spore print on these little guys. These are of the Licinium genus, L-E-C-C-I-N-U-M. And most commonly that you guys know are probably the, the birch bolete. One thing to note is some people do have allergies to uh, this member of the bolete family. So uh, always important to identify it properly and uh, certainly be very careful as there have been some reported uh, you know, allergic reactions to these mushrooms. Well, that was a great harvest. I'm gonna head down now and check out some of my trail cameras. I left them down on another trail uh, close to the water, so I'm really interested to see what we've got there. Uh, it is a really well-traveled trail, and I'm hoping to get some interesting animals down there. I really have to get my uh, remaining cameras in order and figure out where I'm gonna put them, as animals are gonna be on the move this fall. There's the water right here. Here's my trail. So it's a well-traveled trail. And uh, the cabin is just up, well, back that way. Here we have the browning. So I think I have it on video mode, as I recall, just to see what's going through here. Well, it looks like I got lots of video on my trail cam. So I want to take a quick peek at some of these videos. Let's take a look. Well, I really lucked out on the footage. I'm just going to share with you some of the really neat captures I got on the trail cams in my new location. As you can see here, there's a doe and a fawn. And I've got them a few times at this location. Sometimes they appear to be traveling with another individual, which is really neat. I think I might angle the camera the other direction 
because sometimes uh, what I'm noticing is they're always going in one particular way away from the camera. So I maybe want to try to move the camera once I reset this up. I also managed to get a couple of neat captures of a porcupine that tends to follow along this trail. Probably the one that I've seen on the other location camera as well. And of course, got a nice one there of a fox. Well, I guess I'm going to go and head out now and uh, replace the cards and put up some other trail cameras in different places. Thanks for watching today's episode, guys. And don't forget to uh, follow me on Facebook at my Wild Yam Facebook page and now on Twitter. Hope you guys have an awesome week. As always, take care.